consistent with the moderator's plans. What I'll do is uh, edit a lot on the fly here and try to hit just a few slides that, among the ones that are in the deck, uh, of, from the results of partner A and B that make a few points about where we're going from here. And since in the next session there's someone already speaking about the next 20 years, I'll focus primarily on how the FDA is reacting to the current situation and try to show slides from this, the, from the partner results that only sort of lead to those points. So I'll be editing on the fly pretty fast. A challenge second only to that when you arrive and find you have no slides. But, uh, my only relevant disclosure is not a very relevant disclosure because this is not a uh, remunerative position. You all know this. These are my collaborators. Uh, I will take a second on the inclusion criteria and exclusion criteria because that is, the, it's already been mentioned that trial design can produce misleading results and a lot of that frequently has to do with inclusion and exclusion criteria. This I think is familiar to everyone, but the inclusion criteria were severe AS measured in this way, very symptomatic, and then the more subtle ones were high surgical risk and inoperable. A high surgical risk was defined for the partner trial in this fashion using a guideline STS score greater than 10 or a predicted risk of mortality greater than or equal 15 percent as judged by a surgeon and cardiologist. Even though it was a guideline, I'd say the more hard and fast of these was an STS score of around greater than 10 because the surgeon and cardiologist based estimate of greater than 15 was always a little soft. But the target was something in the 10 to 15 percent preoperative predicted mortality risk range. The inoperable definition was quite a bit greater challenge, as you can easily imagine, and this is one where we still have pushback from FDA on how to, how to assess that, and in particular how to stick to that going forward. But what we settled on for the trial was what's illustrated here, predicted risk of mortality or serious irreversible morbidities greater than 50 percent, as assessed by two surgeons at the site. A pretty strict definition, again, is there softness around the edges? Of course there is, potentially. The important exclusion criteria included bicuspid valve. Uh, we just had discussions today and yesterday about el the elliptical nature of the annulus and so forth. It certainly becomes an issue in bicuspid valves. Uh, and they were not permitted in the trial. Whether they should permit be permitted going forward is a good question. Uh, annulus too large, too small is sort of a technical issue, and I'm not sure that's highly debatable. Uh, peripheral vascular access is addressed by the aortic dissection or previous uh, or, or iliofemoral dimensions that are inadequate, also very obvious and sort of technical and might change with time. Uh, severe LV dysfunction, a classic exclusion from most trials simply to make the results a little more predictable and avoid patients with, you know, unsalvageable ventricles. Untreated coronary disease was excluded from this trial, and I mention this because it may be included going forward, and that's one of the points of discussion with FDA. Uh, severe AI and MR we've really talked about. Clinical exclusions, a, a relevant one that always comes up is dialysis dependence. They were excluded from this trial. Patients with creatinine greater than three were excluded from partners. Should they be excluded going forward? Fair question for discussion. I think the others of these are fairly straightforward. So the study design you've seen a hundred times, and I think I won't dwell on it, except in the inoperable arm, one-to-one -one randomization uh, of t TAVI against nothing. And it was an elderly population with high risk, very symptomatic, a bunch of comorbidities and so on. You've seen this. I guess the, I will just in mention in passing the bottom line is the one to keep in mind if you're interested in the as-treated periprocedural mortality. As treated, it was 6.4 percent. What's always cited is the 5 percent that was in the ITT analysis. It was 6.4 in the as-treated analysis. Not a huge difference, but a difference. I'll skip that one. I, and you've seen these, I'm sure, a thousand times, and I've shown them a thousand times, so I'll run by it pretty fast, uh, including the Finkelstein, Schoenfeld, and so forth. Now, stroke, of course, is an issue. And in this particular part, in partner B, the inoperable cohort, 6.7 percent with TAVI versus 1.7 with standard therapy. So a big difference, but of course you wouldn't expect much stroke in the standard therapy group. Nonetheless, a big difference in whether you break it down as all neurologic events or major stroke, the relative difference remains. The frequency of major stroke going down in both groups about, about the same. Of course, vascular complications and things of that sort, bleeding, were more common with the device than without the device, no surprise. And these things, as I think you've seen many times before, had a major impact on survival. 
and the subgroup analyses I will skip today. And the functional results, I think, you, and you've seen these sorts of hemodynamic results. These have been discussed by the previous speaker and so on. Uh, I also won't dwell on this. This is the uh, quality of life results from partner B, the inoperable cohort, showing a substantial improvement in quality of life compared to control. And I won't dwell on this either. This was just, I just heard yesterday, actually, has been accepted in circulation, so you'll be able to read this in circulation. I'll spend a couple more seconds, perhaps, on the cost analysis of partner B, so this, because this becomes, again, re very relevant going forward. They did a pretty thorough assessment of the costs in the partner B cohort. And I won't dwell on the details, except that they come up with a bar graph that shows that if you include the about $5,000 MD cost, it's about a $78,000 procedure. So a relatively expensive index event if you're in the device group. If you look at both groups and then start running it out over a year, you see that, not surprisingly, cardiovascular readmissions in the non-device group start to mount up, and there's a significant difference in cost over the year. That difference doesn't end up, however, overwhelming the index cost, which we'll touch on in a moment. If you take this the next step and do the standard analysis for years of life saved and so forth and the cost of a year of life saved, look at the difference in the curves projected out beyond the, the projection period, beyond the actual observed period of the trial, you get this sort of a figure. So they're basing this on a 1.9 year difference do all these calculations and you find that uh, the, the uh, cost per, year, per life year saved in this trial was $50,000. And if you'd like to know where does that, how does that rank compared to other things, I'll show you in a second. But summarizing the cost data, the index procedure is about $78,000. Follow-up costs are about $23,000 lower with TAVR than standard therapy, but we're still overwhelmed by the procedure costs. And life expectancy increased by about 1.9 at a cost of 50,000 for a life year gain. Now, where does that, how does that rank compared to other things we commonly do? Well, you can see at the far right is, is VADs and things of that sort. This ranks about in the middle of many kinds of treatments that are very familiar to us. And we don't have the answers yet for partner A, for the operable cohort. Uh, those will be forthcoming that they have been analyzed they will be presented at TCT next month. So if you're going to be in San Francisco, you will hear the results of TCT. It doesn't take a genius to speculate that since we know now roughly what the procedural cost is for the index admission, that that's going to be over there uh, to be compared to surgery. And it's going to be, the, the equation is not going to look the same as it did in the comparison to the non-operable group. The high-risk cohort, again, you've heard about this, I'm sure, thousands of times. Uh, two separately randomized groups, those with and without transfemoral access, those without were randomized one-to-one -to, -one to transapical. The only powered arms were the combined pooled all patients and the transfemoral group. The transapical group was not separately powered. And as I'm sure you all well know by now, this was an all-cause mortality at one year endpoint, uh, intent to treat, no crossovers allowed and so forth with an inferiority design. Uh, the study flow, I, I guess the thing worth mentioning each time is that there were 42 patients who weren't treated as assigned, which I think shows an interesting quirk of how the trial was carried out. I think the, the, the problem here was not uh, as bad as the problem we might see going forward. In fact, our, uh, Larry already mentioned that in, in Corvalve, I gather they're having some trouble enrolling in that sort of upper moderate risk group. Uh, that's because patients, I would argue, that's because patients and cardiologists and referring physicians and so on approach this with preconceptions that make it difficult. And that was exactly the problem, even at this stage in randomizing in partner A, that people approach this with preconceptions. So you'll see that that's part of the explanation for the 42. The top two lines of this breakdown, which shows what happened to those 42, uh, are things that happen in any trial and are dealt with effectively by randomization. Uh, Obviously, there's a difference, though, between the AVR group and TAVR group with relative frequencies, not huge differences, but differences. And that's because, for reasons we still don't completely understand, it turned out there was a, a significant difference from the, in the time of randomization in the two groups. So for a host of unexplained reasons, the TAVR patients were treated a little more quickly than the AVR patients, meaning that the AVR patients ate up a little bit more of their 30 days by ITT, 
so yeah. therefore the difference. More interesting is the refusals and withdrawals, which is the point I was just making, that there were almost exclusively that occurred in the AVR group. So you can see that uh, 17 plus 11, 28 patients were entered into the trial, presumably consented, the whole thing discussed with them, saying you'll be randomized to receive surgery of the device. And 28 of the ones who were randomized to receive surgery suddenly decided they weren't eligible for surgery and withdrew. So that's a self-assessment that we're going to be dealing with going forward, and it, there's sometimes not much we can do about that. These results, again, you're very familiar with. Elderly, high risk, symptomatic, so forth. Similar risk profiles to what you've seen with the, uh, I think one of the interesting things about this whole field is how similar the patient populations have been in most of the trials, at least in the early years of this. I think you're also pretty familiar with what happened to some of the results. A uh, little bit shorter ICU stay for the TAVR group compared to surgery. Completely unsurprising that there were more reoperations for bleeding in the surgical group. Uh, but many more aborted procedures, seven versus none for TAVR. Again, not surprising, new technology. Uh, three were failed access, two because of new findings on TEE, and two died. Uh, Interesting to the surgeons, the sternal wound infection was in the sort of predicted range, 2%, and exactly the same rate as access site infections in the other group. Those converted to AVR acutely were, were for valve embolization in five, four annulus changes in three, and one for large septum. Valve embolization looked at in isolation, five were those converted to AVR, two were treated by valve and valve, and, one, and two were not treated and subsequently died. And these you're very familiar with, a clear separation in mortality that converges at one year, but a clear separation suggesting, you know, approaching significance. And the inferiority analysis, which we won't dwell on, was a highly significant p-value, suggesting that these are equivalent treatments with respect to one-year all-cause mortality. The transfemoral subgroup looks even a little bit better. Visually, I think you can see a little greater separation between the curves out to one year. And the non-inferior analysis, of course, very similar. The transapical groups looked very similar. Uh, this remains controversial. This was not a powered comparison, so can't make too much of it. Surgical outcomes always interesting to a group like this. Uh, using the STS risk model as the way to determine E for an ODE ratio, uh, the predicted mortality would have been 11.8. The actual was 8. So that's a ODE of 0.68. So you would argue on that basis, excellent surgical performance. Uh, and there were no significant site or surgeon differences. I, I can assure you that as a, an investigator and part of the executive committee and so on, there was considerable anxiety among the surgeons right up to the time we started looking at the data as to what this would be. Now, there were some re reports you may be familiar with coming out of sort of spin-offs of this population, patients who were referred but not eligible for one reason or another who were being published separately, where the mortality was a very sobering 16 percent, 12, 14 percent in a subset like this. So we, wouldn't have, we could not have been surprised to find that the STS was a very good predictor. And then we would have had to suck that up. And then you can believe that the differences then would have been highly significant compared to TAVR. Now, it's, it's a, the surgeons who were in the trial, of course, would love to say that this is all because of the high skill of the surgeons in the trial, and would that be reproducible elsewhere? Who knows? Uh, but the, we have to acknowledge that it may be that the STS risk score and all related risk scores are not that accurate, especially in this part of the spectrum, so it remains a somewhat nuanced interpretation. Uh, the ITT versus AT subject, I, I think, is a little technical, and I won't dwell on that. Let's look straight to the, uh, to the periprocedural mortality, because this is, I think, where some of the meat is in decision-making going forward. You can see that in the pooled analysis, 3.4% uh, versus 6.5%. And I don't think I have the slide that shows the transfemoral. Maybe I do. I think, if, actually, if we go back, if you just look at the the transfemoral, just notice that for the transfemoral group in the center, 3.7% periprocedural mortality for TAVR versus 8.2 for surgery, 0.05 p-value. So that's damn near significant, right? And that's going to be powering a lot of our assumptions going forward. Vascular complications, bleeding, and so forth. 
this was discussed at, at great length as this was all rolled out. Not surprising, there was more bleeding with surgery, particularly when you include four units or more of transfusion as an endpoint. There will guaranteed to be more of major bleeding in the surgical group. No one was surprised by that. There will also be more atrial fibrillation. This is really the, the main thing by now everyone knows is that looking at all neurologic events, 5.5 versus 2.4%, and then if you slice and dice this into smaller and smaller subsets, this power, of course, was not, this study was not powered to assess events anywhere approaching this low frequency. So not surprising that if you start breaking up the subset of stroke into smaller subsets, there will be no significance. So indeed, there was no significance. But if you look at the, the absolute numbers and the frequencies stay about the same, about twice as many neurologic events, however you define them in the TAVR group versus, surgery, versus the surgical group. So you could say twice as much risk. On the other hand, we have to acknowledge these are pretty low risks. And compared to what I think most any surgeon would have said when they were first presented with this technology, seeing that thing blow up in that valve that we all know is very calcified and friable, we would have said 100% of them will have strokes. You know, to, to be already at this low stroke rate, I think we have to stand back and say pretty remarkable. At least I think we do. Uh, stroke, as you know, has some impact on uh, event, and let's skip this. You may have seen this, at, and we can skip all this because it was presented essentially by the previous presenters and go straight to the uh, discussion. So how has FDA reacted? Well, for inoperable patients, approval is likely very soon, weeks, days, something like that. I think it's a certainty, virtually, although the panel presentation to FDA was a little more contentious than maybe we expected. I think the, the, the panel vote was 9-0-1, one abstention in favor of approval, so it's almost inconceivable that it won't be approved. Uh, stroke remains very concerning. There's no question the FDA is concerned about stroke, and that has a lot to do with what the, the things that will be imposed going forward in trial design. Uh, as I, I think I said two days ago when I spoke about this, that. What I hear from cardiologists in the U.S. is that no one in Europe cares about stroke, or, or words to that effect, that they don't, they don't see the problem. They say, what are, you, what are you talking about? What do you mean stroke? It's just not a, not a problem. Well, I mean, uh, yes, it's a low frequency, but I think I gather, having s listened to a number of presentations, even in Europe, there is, a, there is an incidence of stroke, and it's low, but about twice as common with TAVR. So it's not... We're not over worrying about stroke, and the FDA sure isn't, I can assure you. In fact, I, could, I should tell you that this is a time, and this is true going back four years or longer when we were designing the trial, I've never seen the FDA as concerned about preserving the gold standard. And they were very concerned about protecting surgical AVR from uh, rash conclusions that would you know, can you know, send it to the dustbin of history. Uh, the FDA learned a lesson from the PCI experience. Uh, they also are smart enough to know that surgical AVR is one of the best procedures in surgery, and they did not want that uh, inappropriately uh, set aside. So there was a lot built into the design of the trial that was there to protect the gold standard. And not everybody may appreciate that or agree that it was enough, but I can assure you that they were serious about it. There will be unprecedented post-market surveillance with the inoperable cohort, and I'm sure with all future cohorts, involving neurologic assessments and other things. Uh, the rate of dispersion has been very controversial. The company immediately came out with estimates that were leaked, ultimately, that estimating they'd roll this out to 400 centers in the first year. Huge rollout. Would have been technically very challenging. It'll end up looking more like 100 to 150 or 200, I suspect if only for logistic reasons, but the FDA was also not excited about trying to roll it out that fast. The criteria for being a center as this is rolled out are becoming very clear. I'm glad that uh, Dr. Goite showed the paper from ACC and STS. Basically, that will be sort of the menu, and the, the, the key elements will be large valve volume and a highly functioning valve team, meaning skilled surgeons and skilled interventionalists, not one or the other with kind of a partner. They, they have to be good teams, and the FDA believes in that. 
For the high-risk operable patients, much more controversial. A panel review will be coming up in January or February. It has, the date hasn't been set, but it will be coming up soon. Stroke remains concerning. Of course, there's stroke now, as opposed to the inoperable group, almost no, very little stroke in the control group, of course. There is stroke in the surgical group, but not much. So it is still a concern. In designing the next, uh, there, there, and there will be another round of the trial. They're not just going to wash their hands of randomization at this point. There will be a randomized trial going forward. And the issues with this trial, uh, un this will have unprecedented neurologic surveillance compared to other trials of this sort. Uh, probably half, roughly, of the patients will have a formal pre peri and post neurologic assessment and that's pretty comprehensive. Not every patient, it'll be in about half the centers it looks like. They are very concerned about stroke. This trial will, I think, include both isolated AVR and AVR cabbage in both groups. That's pretty tricky. <clears throat> exactly how to do that will be worked out, but I think that that will uh, be included. Probably the most controversial single element is where is the risk threshold? About a month or two ago, we thought everything was settled and it was going to be four, STS risk threshold of four, based on, in part, the fact that the periprocedural mortality for the TAVR group that I just showed you was 3.7, 3.4 in that range. So four seemed to be where they were headed. Then suddenly, a month or so ago, new view of the world, and all the surgeons in the trial, or many of the surgeons in the trial, were required to uh, testify, in essence, that they had equipoise at that risk level. So those of us who did, did so. I think it will still end up being at around that threshold. There will be two-year endpoints or longer, uh, well, and at least five-year post-market surveillance, I think. Valve and valve, very interesting subject to surgeons. There some great presentations yesterday on valve and ring and so on. The FDA is more concerned, they're more concerned about some of the engineering issues, the metal-metal inter interactions, things of that sort that have yet to be worked out. And this may be a, stub, a sub study in one of the other 2B or 2A, but it will probably just be a sub study and, and they'll have certain uh, restrictions on its, on its use. And maybe I'll stop there because the, the rest of this I know is being covered next and you know, we can all speculate about what will happen in five years. <laughs>